Welcome to Curator's Choice, Spanish Art in Britain and Ireland. I'm Anne Kinseth, Director of Education at the Meadows Museum, and I'm pleased to introduce Julian Harrison. Julian Harrison is lead curator of medieval, historical, and literary manuscripts at the British Library. He's curated the major exhibitions, Harry Potter, A History of Magic, R. Shakespeare, and Magna Carta, Law, Liberty, Legacy. He edits the library's Medieval Manuscripts blog, which was named UK Arts and Culture Blog of the Year in 2014. Among the manuscripts he helps to look after are the unique copy of the Old English epic poem Beowulf, the Magna Carta, and the topic of his lecture today, the Celos Apocalypse. Hello, my name is Julian Harrison and I'm one of the curators at the British Library in London and it's my absolute pleasure today to present to you a lecture about one of my favourite medieval manuscripts. It's called the Celos Apocalypse and I've entitled my talk A Journey into the Medieval Mind. The Celos Apocalypse is held here at the British Library in London. It has the call mark additional manuscript 11695. And I like to point out by telling everybody that it is available to view in full online on the library's digitized manuscript site. And the URL for that is given here on this slide and I'll share it again with you at the end of this particular lecture. So, a little bit of context. Where was the Celos Apocalypse made? We start at the monastery of Santo Domingo de Celos, and you can see an image of it here on the left-hand side of your screen. That's the monastery as it still stands today. It was in the Burgos province in northern Spain and the monastery itself was founded in the 600s. And as late as the 900s, it was still named after, not Domingo, but after San Sebastian de Silos, a separate saint. But then in the 11th century, the monastery was renamed after Saint Domingo or Saint Dominic of Silos, and he dies in the year 1073 AD. The abbey survived for many centuries until it was closed in 1835 with the other Spanish monasteries, but it was later revived by Benedictine monks from France in 1880. Now, the cloister, as you can see it there, was built and dedicated in the year 1088. And that building work continued into the early decades of the 12th century, the 1100s. And that actually coincides exactly with the dates when our manuscript, the Celos Apocalypse, was made. Now, some of the manuscripts that once belonged to that particular monastery remain at that library, including the famous Missal of Silos. It was made around the year 1080. It's also renowned as the oldest European manuscript on paper. That paper was probably manufactured in the Islamic world. But other manuscripts from Silos are now held at other institutions across the world, including the British Library in London and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. And just to give you a little bit of geographical context of where Silos lies, you can see it here on a map of Spain. It's slightly south of Burgos, slightly north of Madrid, and to the west of Barcelona. So I thought I would begin by exploring a review some of the contents of the Silos apocalypse. And it begins with four pages which are taken from a musical manuscript known as the Nartifana. And they actually date from the late 900s. It's the only component of the manuscript 
which belongs to an earlier period in time. And that is because it became quite common in the Middle Ages when a new manuscript was made to line the binding with leaves taken from an older book, a book that had no further use and had been discarded. You can also see though that some of the pages were already being illustrated and I'll come on to those later. But on this slide, you can see the middle image, which is a miniature of hell. And St. Michael is outside the frame, holding the scales to weigh the souls of the sinners. And the image on the right here, one of the pages, contains something known as an Oviedo cross. It's a Greek cross modelled on one made at Oviedo in the year 808. So now we come to the principal contents of a manuscript. The bulk of a manuscript contains a commentary on the Apocalypse, the book of Revelations made by Beatus of Libana. And that manuscript we know was made roughly between the years 1091 AD and 1109. That is over 1000 years ago. And Throughout this particular manuscript, there is a combination of text pages, and among those are a significantly high, and extraordinarily beautiful series of illuminations. On the left hand side of the screen here is an illumination of Christ appearing in a cloud. In the middle, we have Noah's Ark, and I'm going to come back to describe that later in this lecture. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have an angel. And that is followed in the manuscript by a couple of pages taken from the work of another Spanish author, Isidore of Seville. It's excerpts from his etymologies. And on the screen here is a table of kinship from that particular manuscript. And then, what I particularly like about this manuscript, it doesn't just contain an apocalypse on one, a commentary on one book of the Bible, namely the Apocalypse, but it contains another. This is Jerome's commentary on the book of Daniel, again made between the years 1091 and 1109. Here we see on the left hand side the siege of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. In the middle, the adoration of a golden statue and on the right, also from the book of Daniel, we can see Daniel's vision of an angel over the river Tigris. But there's one further component of this manuscript. There are a number of miscellaneous texts added at the end, attributed to Jerome, Augustine, Gregory and other authors. And here are some of the final pages in the manuscript. We have a labyrinth on the left hand side, another Oviedo cross in the middle, and at the end, there is the final page of the manuscript. And I think you can agree with me that we've already seen immediately that the manuscript is beautifully illustrated. We call that illuminated in medieval terms because medieval manuscripts were made by hand. We have to consider that every single component of the manuscript was handmade from the inks which they were used to write the script to the pigments sourced from natural products such as stones, minerals, insects which were used to, con con uh, to make the pigments in the paint down to the parchment which was sourced from the skins probably of cattle or sheep and down to the actual binding would have been handmade. At the time this manuscript was made, around the year 1100 AD, you couldn't go to the local stationery store to buy your supplies. You had to produce and make everything for yourself. And that is why every medieval manuscript dating from this time is unique. Every single one is different. So what do we know about the making of a manuscript? We know it was made at the Benedictine Monastery of Santo Domingo de Silos. We know that the writing itself was completed on the 18th of April, 1091, under Abbot Fortunio, 
Now, lots of people therefore date the making of this manuscript to the year 1091, but I would suggest that given the significantly high number of text pages and the amount of time it would have taken to write them, the manuscript must have been started earlier than the year 1091, perhaps two or three years earlier indeed. But what's quite interesting is that the decoration of a manuscript was continued under Fortunia's successor, Abbot Nunnus, and then it was completed, so we are told, on the 1st of July, 1109, under Abbot John. And why do we know these dates? Because at various points in the manuscript, the scribes and the illuminator wrote what we call colophons, whereby they made notes of the work that they have completed. And we know from those colophons that the scribes, interestingly, were known as Munio and Domenico. And the artist was called Prior Petrus, or Peter, Pedro, and he was a relative of Abbot Nunnus. And it's Prior Petrus, I would, I would suggest, who is the great contributor to this medieval manuscript, the artist behind the Silos Apocalypse. I should also point out that as a medieval manuscript, it was written on parchment, that is, animal skins, and it's written in a type of script which is known as Visigothic Ministry. And here is, a, is an example of what the script looks like. In fact, this is a, an initial at the beginning, says so a prologue of the Blessed Jerome on the book of the Apocalypse by Saint John, the Apostle. That's the heading in red and blue capitals. And then we have Visigothic minuscule script. And this type of handwriting was unique to medieval Spain. And we can tell by the style of the handwriting that it is typical of the types of books which were being written in the 10 hundreds and the early part of the 12th century, the 11 hundreds. So particularly distinctive regional script, which we now know as Visigothic Minuscule. And I just wanted to point out how beautiful the decoration is as well. There are over 100 of these illuminated pages in the manuscript. They often divide sections between the texts and they would have been left blank deliberately by the scribes, allowing prior Petrus to come along at a later stage and add the decoration. But of course, they must have collaborated between each other. The decoration must have been planned before the writing of a manuscript itself had been completed. And here are three examples of the decoration of this particular manuscript. On the left, we have yet another Oviedo cross from the beginning of a manuscript. And the words which we can see written on this page include Pax, Peace, Lux, Light, Rex, King, and Lex, the Law. And this particular Oviedo cross is under an arch which is being held up by human figures. The middle image here shows Christ. And this is a page called Christ in Majesty. And around him, the four roundels around Christ are actually the symbols of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And on the right, we've seen this page already. This is the appearance of Christ in a crown, in a cloud. He's surrounded by six angels, and below him there is a crowd watching below. So, what do we know about the owners of this particular manuscript? Well, let's start at the beginning. We know that it was first owned by the Benedictine Monastery of Santo Domingo de Silos from around the year AD 1091. And it would have remained at that monastery for several centuries. We have to consider, of course, that it would have been perceived, conceived as a teaching aid. Of course, not everybody during the Middle Ages was literate. And so to have a manuscript which was both beautifully decorated, but was also telling the story of the Book of Revelation in pictorial form would have been particularly useful as a teaching aid. The next known owner, possible owner of the manuscript, 
is somebody called Cardinal Antonio of Aragon. He lived between the year 1618 and 1650. And we suspect that he bequeathed the manuscript on his death. It passed to his brother, Pasquale, Cardinal Antonio's brother, who himself died in the year 1677, at which point the manuscript turns up in a college, San Bartolomus, in Salamanca, probably bequeathed to that college by Pascal. And then it remained there for perhaps another hundred years. And then it passed to the Royal Library in Madrid after the colleges in Salamanca were dissolved by King Carlos IV in the year 1799. And the manuscript would have remained there, but on the 9th of May 1840, it was purchased by the British Museum from Joseph Bonaparte, brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, Count of Sevilliers. He lived until the year 1844, and he had previously been King of Spain from the years 1808 to 1813. And it's highly likely that he acquired the manuscript directly from the Royal Library itself. I'd like to spend the remainder of this talk focusing on some of my favourite pages in the manuscript. And I'm going to start with this one. Here is Noah's Ark. And this is an amazing example of the humour at work by Prior Petrus, the illuminator of this manuscript. On the left hand side you'll see the whole page and I've blown it up so you can see a better detail of Noah's Ark itself. Noah's Ark is, is depicted frequently in art from the Middle Ages and Renaissance onwards, but I would uh, hazard to suggest that this is one of the most uh, extraordinary and vivid representations of what the Ark would have li looked like from the mind, the medieval mind of a medieval illuminator. So we see at the top of the Ark we have Noah and he's actually receiving the dove. The dove has just returned with a sprig in its mouth. And Noah, of course, is surrounded on the top level of the ark by his family. And then below, we have three tiers of animals. In the first row, we have a hen, we have a cock, a goat, a hare, and a monkey. And then in the middle row, we have another four animals on the ark, a panther, a bear, a leopard, and a lion. And in the bottom layer of the ark, we have three larger animals, a horse, a camel, a single humped camel, that is a dromedary, and a bull. And the bull is very typical of medieval Spanish art, and indeed even is known by Spanish artists today. I particularly like the faces which are drawn in this particular manuscript and I also love, and we're going to see at some later stage in the lecture, some of the faces on the animals. They all have a, a, a rather cute characteristic about them. And of course, as I mentioned before, every single pigment that was used to create this particular page, the different colours in this illustration, were sourced from nature. But here is another of my favourite pages of the manuscript. This is a map of Mundi, or map of the world. And this again is quite extraordinary. The artist decided to paint the entire world on this double page spread. And you can see the entire map on the left, it's surrounded by the oceans, that blue line. Every single continent is shown on the map from Africa to India to Europe. The blues are the particular rivers in the map and the brown shapes often represent hills, mountains or lakes. Particularly like the scene of paradise here on the right hand side of our screen. Here we have Adam and Eve. They've already been tempted by the snake in the Garden of Eden and we know that because they're now placing fig leaves in an appropriate position on their bodies. And just to show you above, there's the, the highlight 
of the ocean showing the fish swimming around the oceans. And if you look more closely at the map, it's not a geographical representation as we would know it today. It's not designed according to the Mercator projection whereby the Arctic Circle North is at the top of the map. Instead, this is the top left hand corner of the map and Iberia, Spain is given in that section of the map. To the left is Albania, which could be Ireland or Scotland. And to the right of Iberia, we actually have Babylonia or Babylon. I just wanted to compare it very briefly though with another medieval map. The one on the left here was made in Anglo-Saxon England, that is England dating from before the time of the Norman conquest of England and this particular map was made around the year 1040, that's give or take maybe 60 years before the map made at Silos on the right. And the map on the left is a much more accurate geographical representation of the world. If you look very closely, you can see the British Isles, Ireland and Britain in the bottom left hand corner. And immediately to the right of that, we have the Iberian Peninsula. And the sea in the middle is the Mediterranean Sea. And now, of course, at this particular time in history, people weren't able to map the world as we would be able to do today. We wouldn't have had GPS or satellite devices or anything like that. Every single map would have been drawn by hand. But it's still incredible to think that over a thousand years ago, people still were able to form some kind of representation of what the world looked like to them. And thinking again about the world map, the map of Mundi in the Silos Apocalypse, as we can see here, the map itself possibly contains information which dates back hundreds of years and from explorers who had traveled the world going back potentially to Roman times. That's very interesting. It shows that knowledge was being transmitted through books and orally throughout the Middle Ages. And here is another of my favorite pages in this particular manuscript. This is still an illustration from the commentary on the apocalypse and this shows a king sitting on a horse. I just love this particular picture. You can see the horse has got that, that very quaint smile on its face, that nonchalant look. That is a servant holding the king's reins and I particularly like the king's robe and top his head is wearing this absolutely magnificent ornate crown. And we have to understand that, of course, medieval manuscripts such as this provide a really good insight into the fashions of their particular time. And so, although this particular king isn't necessarily depicted on any living figure and his robes and crown aren't necessarily a realistic representation of a crown worn by a medieval Spanish king, they are nonetheless really good ideas of the conception of what the regalia would have looked like around the year 1100. And here is another of my favourite pages in this manuscript. This is taken from the commentary from Daniel from the end of the manuscript and this shows soldiers attacking Jerusalem. So you can see that the scribe began the text halfway down the page allowing room for the illuminator to add his illustration and then at the top of the page the illuminator has shown the soldiers who were attacking Jerusalem which would have actually been shown on the opposite page of this manuscript. Some of the soldiers are shown on horseback they're carrying banners, they're holding lances, there are foot soldiers armed with swords and carrying shields, and there are bowmen as well, firing arrows at the city of Jerusalem. And some of the soldiers are sitting on war horses. Now, 
what does this particular illustration remind you of? I was thinking about this quite closely and I decided that the representation of the soldiers attacking Jerusalem in the Silos apocalypse resembled this particular item on the left. This is the famous Bayer Tapestry. It was made after the Norman conquest of England. It shows the leading events in the run-up to the Battle of Hastings in 1066 when Duke William of Normandy overcame King Harold of England in battle and seized the English throne. And I was particularly taken by the fact that the soldiers in both the Bear Tapestry, shown here on the left, and the ones in the Seagull's Apocalypse on the right, are both wearing uniforms which are remarkably similar. They all seem to be wearing chainmail. They all have pointed helmets, and those helmets all have nose guards. They use the same weapons, lances, they carry swords by their sides. There are arrows flying through the air, and they're seated, mounted on war horses. And that gives me the confidence to say that a manuscript such as the Seed of Apocalypse and its representation of war, although it was showing a biblical siege, that is, the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, nonetheless, the way that the artist depicted the soldiers harks back and reflects the uniform, the military assemblage, the apparel that would have been worn around the year 1100 in medieval Spain. Another of my favourite pages in this manuscript. Here is Daniel in the lion's den. Again, this is an incredibly beautiful image, not only for the different pigments that are used in this page, the oranges, the yellows, the browns, the reds, the greens, the blues, all sorts from natural minerals and insects. I love the fact though that Daniel stands in this picture, you have two angels flying above and by his feet, very obediently, subserviently even, his feet are being licked by a pair of lions. And that is the first scene on this particular page. And if you look below, you can see another biblical scene. This is King Darius, who's lying awake in bed. You can often say that medieval manuscripts are effectively almost akin to comic books. They're often cartoon-like in their quality. They show different sequences of events. And of course, you can understand what is happening from this picture, even if you could not read the Latin text itself. Now, here is one of the most incredible double page spreads in the entire Silos apocalypse. This page is known as the woman and the beast. And there are multiple things happening on this page, so let me explain some of them to you. We have in the left hand register of the page the so called woman clothed with the sun. And then below we have the son of a woman who's confronting the beast. And the beast itself, this six headed serpentine monster, is being attacked simultaneously by Saint Michael, the archangel, accompanied by the angels. And then separately in the upper right corner of the page, we have the son of a woman standing before the throne of God. And this is a reference to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 1 to 18. It's for the, the triumph of the rider over the beast. And in the bottom of the page, we can see all the souls which uh, the angels and the archangel Michael are trying to save from a beast. And that highlight on the right hand side of the screen here shows the many heads of the six headed beasts where we are confronting the woman 
flow through the sun. And as I was looking at this particular image, another artwork came to my mind. And that is a very contemporary artwork, given that it was made in 1937. It's Pablo Picasso's response to the bombing of Guernica in the Basque country in 1937. The original painting of which is exhibited in the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid. And that painting by Picasso portrays suffering of people and animals, including screaming women, dismemberment, and flames. And interpretations of this painting vary widely, but it is well held that Picasso's Guernica painting represents pain and chaos. And it has been described by the British art historian Jonathan Jones as a cubist apocalypse. And that's quite apt in the context of a medieval manuscript such as the Ceylon's Apocalypse. I'm certainly not saying that Picasso drew in any shape or form upon the Ceylon's Apocalypse manuscript itself. He may not even have known about it, almost certainly would never have seen it, either in the flesh or even images of it. And yet, there are running things which uh, start, the traditions start in the late 11th century in Silos, um, which potentially are carried over through generations of Spanish artists, culminating in this painting, Guernica, as I say, the Cubist Apocalypse, according to Jonathan Jones. Now, another of my favourite pages from this manuscript. Here we see the angel chaining Satan, who is represented by a snake. And this is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. And I'm particularly fond of the fact that in this particular manuscript, and indeed in lots of medieval art, devil, Satan, is depicted in serpentine, reptile form, as a snake depicted here. If you even think of your Harry Potter stories, the snake Nagini is the right-hand man, almost, of Voldemort. And here we have the angel chaining the snake from the book of Revelation. And again, just looking at this particular page, you can see the way that the artist actually shows differentiation between the page, but, but even the background is coloured. We have this beautiful ochre pigment behind the angel. We have a darker red above. We have this beautiful patterning on the snake itself. The border of the image has been decorated with this interlaced motif, and we have a beast, the beast, which is depicted as a ball, strangely, thinking about the Guernica painting. Just here, there's a ball depicted on the left here. Balls occur time and time again in the Seagull's Apocalypse to represent the beast, and there is the beast being wrapped around with a rope at the bottom of the page is actually in ball form. And I like to think that Picasso potentially was harking back to that same medieval manuscript tradition. And here is the final favourite page from this particular manuscript. Here we have the last judgment. And I would hazard to suggest that this is one of the, the greatest representation of the last judgment in medieval art. It's idiosyncratic, it's unique, it only occurs in this particular manuscript. And you can see it's divided into two pages. 
and then there is a hierarchy of the figures. First of all, in the top of the page, on the left, we have Christ in majesty, flanked by two angels. And below him, we have the judges sitting. And then we have, going on to the right hand side, we have rows of people coming to be judged. But slightly horrifically, we can see the bodies of the damned below in the bottom right hand corner of the page, reflecting the text of the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And thinking about the Seamus Apocalypse as a work of medieval art and as a journey into the medieval mind, I'm really taken by the fact that as we've gone through the manuscript, we have seen time and time again that there is this absolutely incredible sequence of painted pages showing biblical scenes such as the siege of Jerusalem, Noah's Ark and Daniel in the lion's den and culminating in this extraordinary sequence of pages relating to the apocalypse and to the last judgment. And one of the questions we often get as medieval manuscript creators is how on earth has a book like that survived for so long? And there are of course many answers to that question. First of all, it's undoubtedly survived because of its sheer beauty. It would have been revered and treasured not just by the people who made it and the monastery of Silos in the 1090s and the early decades of the 1100s, but by the later owners, by those cardinals, by the royal librarians in Spain, and again, and until present day times at the British Library in London. Another reason why this manuscript has survived for so long, strange enough, it's written on parchment. I referred to this already. Parchment is animal skin. They are sheets of skin made from the skins of cattle, primarily, or sheep or goats, and scraped and processed in order to make this writing material. And parchment itself is extraordinarily durable. It's very difficult to tear. It even it can only be burnt at very high temperatures, whereas modern day paper is actually quite friable. It actually dissolves very quickly. Think in particular of newspapers, say, particularly newspapers which were made in the middle decades of the 20th century. They tend to disintegrate now. Find an old paper uh, kept maybe in an attic or a storeroom somewhere, and it would have discolored and it would already be incredibly fragile to touch and liable to break. Parchment doesn't do that. The other thing that people always observe when they see a medieval manuscript like this for the very first time is how incredible are the colours. They are so vivid, they are so bright. And you have to remember, of course, that that is partly because they haven't been exposed permanently to the light. This is, isn't a medieval painting to be hung in an art gallery or a wall painting on the walls of the church. This is a book which for most of existence would have been kept shut. And as a result, each of those paintings would have been preserved perfectly. And if we even think about national art collections, we are thinking about national art collections, say in London or in Paris or in Washington DC, medieval paintings in those collections are rather small in number and they often date from the later centuries of the Middle Ages, from the 1400s and the 1500s, written often, painted often on, on wood or on plaster. Whereas look at an extraordinary medieval manuscript such as the Silos Apocalypse, an album effectively of paintings like the Silos Apocalypse, and it is witnessed to hundreds in this particular instance of 
medieval paintings, all of a quality that would normally deserve to be on display in a public gallery. And so we'll draw into the end of my lecture. And this is the very final page of the text. And this page is rather peculiar in itself. You can see this wonderful little flowered border around the edges of the page. And then we have these three flower motifs sticking up from the bottom of the page. And the script, rather than being written in black ink, is written in a combination of blue and red. And it's been written for the glory of God, because for the scribes and for the artists, this was an act of devotion to copy out this particular manuscript, the commentary on the apocalypse and the other texts found within, was an act of great spiritual devotion. And the text ends with the words, explicit Deo gratias semper. Deo gratias semper always. Here ends this particular book. And I thought that would be a fitting way to end this particular lecture. Now, I'm sure you'd like to learn more about the student's apocalypse. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this particular lecture, you can see the entire manuscript for yourself online on the British Library's digitised manuscripts website. It's free to access and you can zoom in on the images and see them in great detail. It has the call number and MS additional manuscript 11695. It is indeed one of the greatest treasures of the British Library. And as I have argued today in this lecture, it is one of the greatest manuscript treasures from medieval Spain. And although, in essence, it's purely, primarily, a book conceived by its scribes to explain and to copy out the commentary on the apocalypse, as I've suggested here today, it also gives us an unrivaled insight into the medieval mindset. And as I entitled this lecture, A Journey into the Medieval Mind. It's been my absolute pleasure to present this lecture to you today. Hope you enjoy, all enjoy watching it and that you have many questions for me, which I'm really looking forward to answering at a future date. So I'd just like to conclude by uh, asking you all to take care out there. I know that these are very difficult times, not just here in the United Kingdom, but across the world and particularly in the United States of America. I hope that you and your families are all safe and well, and that you remain so. And I'm really privileged to have been given this opportunity to share this incredible manuscript with you today. Take care out there and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Goodbye.